everyone, and welcome to the virtual Ackland. My name is Elizabeth Manikin, and I'm the head of university programs and academic projects here at the museum. Um, and today is Art for Lunch. And I imagine some of you are familiar with this series, but Art for Lunch is a recurring program in which I usually interview a faculty colleague or visiting scholar about um, the ways in which they engage with the museum, uh, usually through their courses. And um, we do that in myriad ways, but usually these conversations revolve around our installations um, in Ackland Upstairs. And in this pandemic year, we've called Ackland Upstairs object lessons because it is downstairs. Um, but this is really a time when we can talk about the interdisciplinarity of our work and invite um, our colleagues here to hear straight from the source. So before I introduce our special guest today, Professor Patricia Sawin, wanted to go over some technical aspects of our program. This is a webinar, and so you will not have audio or video showing. Um, you can engage though through the chat function, and if you have questions, I encourage you to put them in the Q&A. Um, this will be recorded and might be used in various museum endeavors. So um, Professor Patricia Salwin is a professor of folklore here at UNC, and she is interested in the everyday stories that people tell to make sense of their experience in the world. And her most recent scholarship, um, I think, reflects some of the range of those stories. Um, she's interested in transnational adoption and she's also most recently published an intellectual and institutional history of the academic discipline of folklore, a collection um, that I hope she'll talk about a little bit. And I'll let her talk more about that. But um, first, I just wanted to welcome and say thank you to Patricia for coming. Um, I thought that you, if you could begin a little bit by telling us a little bit more about your research, what do you do as a folklorist? Okay. Thank you, Elizabeth, and I'm delighted to be here. Um, thank you to people who are listening in. Um, perhaps to step back one step, to me uh, as a folklorist, I will confess that, you know, I got interested or intrigued by the discipline of folklore because I had some romantic notions about fairy tales and, you know, people dancing cool dances in European villages. But um, increasingly to me, the, the, you know, philosophical question at the heart of contemporary folklore really has to do with um, in a world where we have our practical and even artistic needs, you know, met by the, you know, the touch of a button, order something from Amazon and it arrives. It comes from heaven only knows where it's made out of heaven only knows what. Um, that there are places where people decide to make stuff for themselves um, and to share it with other people. Um, and uh, whether that making is the telling of a story or the, I happen to have been talking about quilts in my, uh, in my class just a few minutes ago. Um, or, you know, all kinds of, you know, throwing a party for someone with some special, all of those kinds of things, making music. But why is it that we are interested in doing that? why oh, and and that answer varies as much as the people who do it it can be uh you know can be very sentimental my grandmother always made this kind of pot roast or this kind of simis for uh you know for passover um my uh you know my um my grandfather showed me how to whittle um it can be um uh, you know, just kind of practical, like, oh, it really makes more sense to make this thing at home now that I know it's cheaper to make my own yogurt. Um, or it can be very, you know, political, uh, if we think about back to the land movements or people like that. But, um, you know, a lot of joking, a lot of storytelling is really very critical. Um, uh, and so, uh, you know, you may get most of your entertainment out of watching TV shows, but nevertheless, there's a part of you that is saying, I've got to get my own word in here. 
Um, and then it, of course, gets all very complicated. I would say there's there's never any absolute line between what is a folklore and what is a not a folklore. <laughs> um, uh, often students, I think it's different now, but actually folklore has spent a lot of time trying to define what exactly was folklore and what was this hard line. Um, because in the 50s and 60s, they thought that that was what a discipline was going to be about. It had to have its own object. But much more interestingly to me is the, the flow between my, my major professor, uh, Richard Bauman, used to say, you know, the whole business of categorizing things is interesting. Um, we do that as a natural part of our human way of talking about stuff, but the pigeonholes always leak. And the, the leakiness is, is what's fun. So now actually, I mean, young upcoming, you know, folks, uh, folks who are, you know, gonna be the next generation of, of folklorists, I'm getting to know them because there's the Thursday night folklore Zoom and they talk about things. Um, but also they are now doing a, a weekly, and I'm even gonna forget the name, but it's where some people are playing an online game and other people are joining them and watching and commenting on it. Um, so do you know what that's called? They've told me, I haven't joined them yet. I'm afraid I don't. Okay. Um, but, and, and then each week they advertise on Instagram that, and they talk about memes and they, you know, so all of, all of this, like, uh, Jack Box says something, one of our, okay, that might be it. Uh, yeah, you're, you're, you're ahead of me, but I'm trying to catch up with my new colleagues. Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, I now in the middle of one of my classes a year ago, I realized that students didn't really understand legends or, or pass legends on in, um, uh, in, in oral context very much, except more formal things, maybe a, a camp or maybe a, um, like a, a dorm monitor person, but that what they were excited about creating and sharing among themselves was memes. So I did a mad weekend immersion in meme study and changed our whole paper topic for <laughs> the middle part of that class. Um, so folklore is always evolving what it is that people make and by what means. It may not be, you know, whittling and stitching and it may be, you know, online, you know, collaging of photographs. Um, so, but that, that question of where in our lives we want to make stuff ourselves and share that kind of stuff, um, which may be very, you know, historical, old fashioned, traditional, or it may be um, very innovative, but it, it has something to do with taking control of um, artistic process, even if it's only at a, rel you know, it's not at a super expert level. So that's folklore, but Again, you asked me about my own, my own work. Yeah, yeah. but I think that okay. that's a really helpful foundation in thinking about all of these, not only things being expressed, but the ways in which they are expressed in different kinds of communities, absolutely. So yeah, please tell us, yeah. please keep going. Okay, okay. So, um, so I mean, my uh, long-term thread of interest in my work has been in uh, uh, the kinds of stories. I teach a class that's called Everyday Stories. It's the stories that we almost without thinking about it um, tell each other. Um, and uh, many of them are about our own life experiences. So that idea that, um, for one, that it's worth just pausing and paying a little bit more attention. It's like uh, whether that's my roommate comes in every day and always has a funny story to tell or, you know, oh, you know, actually I remember that my grandfather uh, used to tell me these stories about his early life. And, and uh, I sometimes think that a, a major part of the rationale for that class is that I give students an excuse to go to people who they know and care about, or sometimes people that they don't know, but are curious about, and to say, 
please would you help me? My evil teacher has demanded that, you know, that I record some stories. Yes. And um, yeah, I hope they don't say my evil teacher, but um, but to say, you know, that often, and I, I mean, there are people who, who I cherish who are gone, who I wish I'd had, I would ask if I could record their stories and they would, you know, they were modest or whatever, and they didn't quite want that to, to happen. And so the chance, I mean, one of the most amazing experiences that I've had in that class, um, I'm, I'm gonna talk about my students before I talk about myself, but I promise I'll come back. But I mean, one, one year there was a, a young woman when, when we weren't doing this on Zoom and she had borrowed a little tape recorder um, and she said, oh, my dad tells all these funny stories. I'm going to, I'm going to get him to tell me some of those. I was like, great, that'll, that'll be fabulous. That's clearly a really, you know, significant thing in your family. Her dad took the recorder, went into his study, closed the door and talked for a couple of hours and brought it back to her. And he told her all of his Vietnam experiences that he had never talked to anybody else about. Mm -hmm. So that was something where, you know, the, the, the experience that she had from that and that he had from that was, went far, far beyond, um, you know, anything that was our analysis of stories in the class. Um, another, um, you know, lovely example that I can think of was someone who, uh, Dis, he, he, there was a, a man who we often saw um, panhandling on Franklin Street and decided to, to stop and see if he would talk to him. And this man was so glad to have somebody to talk to. And he said he was living in the, the shelter when the shelter was, was there um, in, the, in the old um, uh, building on the corner of Rosemary and, and uh, you know, what is that, an MLK. Um, and, but that he, somebody had taken a picture of him and had put it in on the front page of the, of the Daily Tar Heel. And he felt that that had represented him as sort of a bum, as somebody who, you know, was a parasite on society. And he told this young man all about how he was a baker and he really, you know, he wanted to get back into his profession, but that right now he was living in the shelter and the shelter had very particular hours. You had to be, if you're going to sleep there, you had to be there from 8 p.m. to 8 a.m. And as a baker, you have to go to work at two or three in the morning. Um, but he had an opportunity to talk all about his skills and, um, you know, as well as some of the challenges that he had faced. So, I mean, I just love hearing, getting to hear the stories, um, yeah. you know, all kinds of things. But, but the other thing that we do in that class is really to, th and that I do in, in my own work, is to think about the stories that people tell, you know, we mostly toss them off rather artlessly. Um, but uh, if you think about them from almost a literary point of view, you ask about characterization, you ask about, you um, you know, the handling of time and what is put into the past and what is, you know, now and what is projected in the future. If you think about, you know, particular language and, and turns of phrase and, and discourses that people are, you know, plugging into to make certain implications. Um, and particularly in oral storytelling, um, one of the pieces I find most fascinating is thinking about reported speech that when you tell a story, you so often um, characterize the other people or yourself sometimes with quoted speech, which um, often, so uh, it has various powers, but it puts words into other people's mouths, sometimes to make them more powerful, sometimes to kind of um, separ you know, separate them from yourself. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, and, and sometimes, I mean, I love the ones where people will say, you know, and then I thought, although I would never dare say it, quote, end quote, you know, <laughs> it's like, uh, yeah, linguists have talked about that way that we, you know, we, we make up 
uh, words or, you know, and then mom was all like, rah, 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 rah. well, that may not be exactly what your mother said at that moment, but um, it, it, it's an eff effective, it's a very artistic way of getting something across. Um, but um, in my earlier work, I did my dissertation work and, and, and a book about a woman named Bessie Eldreth from the mountains of North Carolina from uh, Watauga County. And she was in many ways of, you know, she was very religious. She was a very, you know, um, uh, she had very strong feelings about, you know, sort of women's role and proper, um, uh, you know, proper ways to interact with people. She, um, uh, but, but, um, and, and um, she was pretty loath to come out and make any, you know, she was not somebody who would, you would ever say was a, a feminist or would ever, you know, latch onto that. Um, but I started to realize that she had story after story in which she would um, very subtly um, suggest the ways in which her husband had not been supportive to her. Um, uh, she, and uh, so, I mean, two things that I can particularly think about. One is that she had gotten kind of known for going around to schools and telling ghost stories. Okay, you know, eh, ghost stories, nobody believes that stuff, whatever. Well, for starters, these were things that had really happened to her or to her, you know, mother or her aunt. Um, but very often there was a gender dimension there that, um, that the women were not, you know, were denying any fear of these weird things that happened because that gave them a certain kind of power. Whereas the, when the men or her kind of ne'er-do-well husband, you know, uh, got, got scared. Or there would be critiques. I mean, there's one really haunting story where um, someone finally says, oh, well, you know, the reason you hear babies crying in that house is that the bad girls lived in that house and they, and they drowned their babies in the well. Um, you know, so that was the local brothel. But, you know, then there's this kind of like, okay, so what about the men? You know, who's really responsible for putting these women in this desperate situation? Yeah. I think, I think that sense of sort of patterns and subtext and, and the ways that I know you and I have talked about it before, yeah. sort of the ways in which you can look at language and the structure of a story, but also through those structures sort of see, you know, the tendencies of the person. Yeah. whether subverting meaning or sort of coded in some way. Um, and there are of course analogous aspects of that to makers, sort of that like physical makers that have right. it form and the tells that they have. And yeah, I think it's a really, the, the, the analogous aspects of what is, what is the story? What is the style of the story? What are the implications to different audiences? Like those are all analogous. Yeah. Um, in the materials. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and Patricia, I'm wondering, yeah. oh, go ahead. No, I was going to ask you where you wanted to, to oh. direct me. <laughs> well, I, I, I wanted to, I mean, that foundation of folklore, I think, speaks to Patricia's teaching two courses that are using the Ackland this semester. One is an introduction to folklore, um, and one is a more advanced seminar that's talking about these everyday stories and aspects of narrative. And both have been using this installation of North Carolina ceramics, as well as some other works that are on view in object lessons. And I wonder, Lindsay, could you show perfect? Um, so for those of you who've not had opportunity to visit the Ackland, and I encourage you to do so if you feel comfortable, um, we are open by, um, you have to register, it's free, it's wonderful. Um, but this is what the installation looks like. And in the foreground, you can see a quilt on the floor um, or on a plinth that is lower um, by Emma Petway and just past it you'll see these pedestals with um, different different North Carolina examples of North Carolina pottery right there and so I'm wondering Patricia could you talk a little bit about the ways in which your teaching and study of folklore intersect with your work teaching in the museum or working with us and teaching in the museum. Yeah, yeah. Um, 
so uh, particularly we um, we use the the Ackland um, and and I have to say because Elizabeth is smart and reaches out to people so <laughs> says you know we've got these great pots wouldn't you like to um, you know we could we could make you an exhibit so I'm I'm grateful to you for your um, you know reaching out in that way um, but I think Excuse me. It's it's. I mean, I always try in folklore classes to um, make sure that there is a North Carolina component because um, uh, so many of our students are from North Carolina, and I want them to see. Uh, I think you know a part of um, the study of folklore and and uh, material culture is also. Uh, making those connections, you know, we sometimes go art museum, you know, uh, you know, great old things that were made a long time ago or made by people who are, you know, have these amazing inherent skills and, you know, it's like way foreign and it's, you know, it has nothing to do with me. Um, and so that uh, reminding people of, of the, you know, the, the um, practical and artistic creativity of um, their you know, forebears in this state um, is uh, is a way of both of um, sort of empowering young people and helping them to remember that, you know, people not so different from them have capacities to make all of these things. And of often of, you know, not in the pandemic year, but otherwise physically getting them into the space of the museum and going, oh, while you're here, you know, why don't you go look at these amazing, you know, Chinese and Korean ceramics or look at the modern art or look at the, you know, the, the other uh, exhibitions that you have um, up. And I love it that, um, that actually others of my colleagues who asked for exhibits um, this year for their from for the object lessons actually they pulled up stuff that I wanted them to use in my class as as well mm -hmm. um, so yeah and and um, I had another thought but it'll um, but I think yeah getting people into the museum getting uh, the students uh, it, you know interested in also in exploring this again it's uh, you know the pigeonholes leak it's like you know there's some continuum from you know a, a half pint jug that somebody made in the 1800s because their neighbor had a still and they were selling you know they needed that to sell their moonshine whiskey with a corn cob and you know a Rembrandt or you know um I actually was just in in the preparation for the for this talking about quilts. I was just looking at images online and realized that, um, and I'm I'm going to forget her name, but the contemporary artist who made the amazing portrait of Michelle Obama. Amy. Um, yeah, that part of 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 Obama's dress in that is like an African American style quilt, which of course is probably also. Um, has an aesthetic that people remembered from West African textiles. Um, you know, so the connections are there if we start looking for them. Yeah. Yeah. And that's one of the things I know that in our discussions, we talked a lot about traditions and the ways in which traditions morph and change and artists can sort of take those on. And in the installation too, we see different glazing techniques and the ways in which they migrate from different parts of the world or the country. And so yeah. these remnants of other visual traditions or ways of making, they're always sort of layering, layering in, in different ways. And I wonder, I know you just read about quilting and we'll be with your class uh -huh. next week. Yeah. Um, are there specific moments either from this year or pre-pandemic days specific objects or moments that you feel really illustrate the power of using these objects in, in your teaching? Oh, how, how to pick. <laughs> um, I mean, one of the things just as a sort of general is that um, you and, and um, you know, the graduate fellows who have helped us um, with this um, know, uh, stop, and really get us to look. Um, I think it's very easy 
for for me and for anybody to kind of we we see something we categorize it and it's like this is what that means and and we're on and particularly in the the world of doom scrolling i mean how quickly do we absorb process and go on and so the fact that um people who are trained to bring folks into the museum will with whatever object it is say wait stop what do you see and make us say out loud stuff that sound we're embarrassed because it sounds well the glaze is shiny in some places and kind of bubbly in others or you know and that those are the the details that then you know actually help us to think about you know a human being with certain ideas and certain capacities and certain tools created this thing um so that every time is just amazing is one of the reasons i want to turn my class over to the experts um wow i'm trying yeah show us the um the the then the, let's see then so well I mean, here's a gorgeous thing. Go to, if you can, Lindsay, go to that next one, which is that little like, you know, you know, small jug. It's not very big. And in some ways, you know, I mean, do you love that shape or do you not love that shape? And yet, if you think about both, you know, the, um, you know, there, there are other shapes that, that I even love more, but that that's someone who, a, was a production potter and who figured out anybody, some of you probably who are listening have done um, some potting and turning on a wheel is not easy. Um, getting, just getting the blasted little bit of clay centered, but that somebody could turn out, you know, dozens if not hundreds of these in, in a day, that they learned how to do it, that they learned to create a shape that was really practical and yet it has this lovely you know form to it the handle is nice and sturdy is just right you can imagine somebody you know putting a finger through it or a thumb through it and and drinking out of that thing or pouring out of it um and and uh this is one where they've actually then made taken a moment to put a couple of little decorative lines on it um yeah let's see maybe uh Lindsay shows oh it's well the 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 zeo one but go back one um if you can yeah this one you know and and uh as we now know uh you know it's salt glazed it was really simple salt glazing as i've learned from my former colleague carrie zug you know, uh, it, it was you just open up the top of this blazing hot kill and and pour salt in, and it vaporizes and then forms a layer. But you know, on the one hand, this is something where a person has really you know taken care with those um, with with that you know beaded repeated decoration. But just the shape of that thing is so gorgeous. I love this one very much. Yeah. Yeah, and just to know that when that was sold, um, you know, middle of the of the 19th century, all that happened was that somebody would say, I want a five gallon jug and, you know, and it was like 10 cents a gallon, you know, and yet, you know, people came to Enoch Craven and, and wanted his because they were nice to use. They were, um, you know, now you, if you have, pottery in your house it's probably all a mug it's all been scientifically you know thought of to make it balance the right way you know here's my my new calamity wear mug um but this one doesn't work well if i try and hold it like that you know i've got to hold it up here it's actually it's cool but it's not perfect but these people learned by trial and error how to create something that uh, was was balanced was five gallons is a lot um, you know that full that thing is going to weigh more than 40 pounds right so um, is that right no more than 20 pounds a pint's a pound but um, uh, yeah but the the beauty of that and I would bet that the walls of that are really even they're really thin um, 
you know, you don't want to waste clay, but also that's the sign of a really good potter. Um, so, yeah, so it's aesthetically beautiful to the eye, but it's also, I would bet, if I get my hands on it, <laughs> aesthetically beautiful to the user. Yeah. Um, and, and as far as the ways in which the students engage too, in looking at all of these different forms, you know, they're made over the course of the 19th through the 20th centuries. And, um, and you know, having the students imagine what would it feel like to hold this? What might you put in this? And distinguishing between those that were clearly for storage of some sort and mm -hmm. others that are more decorative in their influence and sort of thinking about this could be a display bowl or this could be this um, Zia Pueblo um, dough bowl is actually a part of an installation for um, Professor Maggie Chow who's an art historian and will actually be our next guest for Art for Lunch um, next month. But Maggie's installation is looking at the history of American art and thinking about um, different um, different media, different materials, different regions that are often not within the canon of big A, big A American art as we learn it. And so, but this is another great example of something that was produced in the 19th century in many ways to be utilitarian, but was also at a moment when Zia ceramics were very popular in the art market. And so you have this marriage of utility and aesthetic that are, um, you know, re really very much united here, but the inside of this is not glazed because you would be mixing dough for, to make tortillas probably. Um, but, but you have that conversation, I think, in the space and the students can really start to see, okay, what would this shape accommodate, right? How would you hold that mug? how would you be able to lift this if you needed to lift it? Would it be by the base? Would it be by the handles? And not, obviously this doesn't have any handles, but you know what I mean. Um, so, so those conversations, not only about utility and the reasons for its production, but then the afterlife of the object too. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, yeah. And of course, um, uh, in, the, uh, in the North Carolina pottery, there was this long period from the, you know, sort of late 1700s that, yeah, this is a perfect example, um, up through the, the first part of the 20th century where people were making utilitarian, they were making churns and they were making jugs and as well as, you know, plates and plates and bowls. Um, and then, uh, you know, as all of that utilitarian stuff gets um, replaced by glass and plastic canning jars and um, those kinds of things, um, then uh, there's this revival um, in the, in the, particularly in the 1930s and, um, you know, some efforts from uh, outside supporters um, to encourage people to transform their, their skills into something. So now, the area around um, around you know Jugtown uh, is you know there's this huge uh, North Carolina there's a, a pottery museum that my predecessor uh, Professor Terry Zug was very instrumental in getting started um, but but there are all kinds of potters both those who continue to do um, much more traditional uh, forms. And then people who create largely, um, art, uh, you know, uh, aesthetic, decorative, you know, crazy uh, starburst glazes and all kinds of new things. But and I love that about that area um, that you know there are people who are still digging their clay in their on their property because that's one of the reasons that a, a pottery producing area grew up there. Um, and there are people who are importing, you know, the latest, uh, you know, uh, chemicals and styles and, you know, materials that they, that they need. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, well, I'm, I'm seeing the time and I want oh. to make sure we get to our wild card. Um, oh, okay. <laughs> so familiar um, with Art for Lunch and our programs know that at the Ackland, we developed this card game called Musings in honor of the muses and their house, the Museus or museum. 
Um, and it's really, it's comprised, it's comprised of artist quotes, um, quotes from philosophers, scholars, museum professionals about the nature of art, nature of museums. Um, some of them are very serious, some of them are very silly. And usually I would have you pull from the deck, um, Patricia, but today I will have you um, pick a number between one and five, please. Uh, three. Okay. Um, this is a quote from the artist uh, Gustave Courbet, and I'll read it now. Beauty, like truth, is a thing which is relative to the time in which one lives and to the individual capable of understanding it. The expression of the beautiful bears a precise relation to the power of perception acquired by the artist. I'm gonna read it again. Beauty, like truth, is a thing which is relative to the time in which one lives and to the individual capable of understanding it. The expression of the beautiful bears a precise relation to the power of perception acquired by the artist. So in what ways are, are your ideas of beauty specific to our cultural moment? And in what ways are they timeless? Well, I, I let's see, uh, many ways to start answering that question. Um, I, I love hearing that someone whom we think of as uh, Courbet is, you know, like a, a, a name, something that if anybody's taken art history, they will know and know the additions that he made in the kind of, you know, canonical history of, of European art. Um, is talking about this, of course, now, and, and partly he's thinking about kind of historical change because he's part of this, you know, sort of more revolutionary, like the, the, the styles of the past, we don't, you know, we're, we're tired of those. Well, we want to do something new um, that speaks more directly to people or whatever. But, um, but I love that notion. And I think folk, one of the founding notions around folklore is that different groups have different notions of what appeals to them and whether that's change over time or whether that's, you know, sort of culture specific. Um, uh, and that, uh, that the, the notion that there is this single thing called beauty um, can, can prevent you from recognizing um, the validity, uh, you know, or the appeal to particular folks of what, um, uh, what is uh, what is beautiful to them? So the notion that, and, and it's a it's a formalist notion of art that folklorists worked on that it's simply you do something and you offer it to people for the enhancement of their experience, and it is maybe within cultural expectations or maybe it stretches those a little bit, um, and but that you get evaluated for how it appeals to people. So to me, that notion of being aware that on the one hand, there probably are things that just speak to our heart. <laughs> I'm starting to think about Courbet paintings, <laughs> thank you. But, um, but that uh, something, something that doesn't immediately appeal to us, there's always the opportunity to gain knowledge and understanding, to see things from the point of view of a different group or a different time period. You know, what is mannerist? Like, why are all those skinny people? You know, it's like, oh, well, but there's a reason that that appealed to them and that artists wanted to paint that way. Um, and and that, um, that, I mean, connoisseurship is uh, this, you know, I mean, it sounds like this hoity-toity word, but that's really about getting educated to understand what were those people aiming at, you know? Um, and what is, and then, then you can see, I mean, even if you decide you don't like it, but you can say, oh, they did a great job of what they were aiming at. Um, and the people who, who shared that aesthetic with them must have really loved that. Um, and that to me is, is such a crucial way of kind of opening up our, our, our hearts and our minds <laughs> to the variety of, fantastic things that people create in the world. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you, Patricia. I, I kind of want to go through the whole deck with you, but I see <laughs> we have some questions in our Q&A section. So perhaps we should 
open up to those in our in our final in our final minutes. Yeah, sure. I'd be happy to help um, with that. Hi, everyone. I'm Lindsay. I was running behind the scenes, and let's see what our first question is. All right. We have a participant who's wondering if you were part of the stories of UNC and Chapel Hill that took place a few years ago that was turned into an art project as well as a story project. I wasn't part of that. I'll have to go back and, and find out about it. Yeah, I've, I've had a part in a more recent story set of storytelling performances. Um, where we invited uh, storytellers from a whole bunch of different traditions. But yeah, I, yeah. I'm sorry I wasn't. Sounds like a guy I should have, should have asked to be. <laughs> There's so many fascinating things happening across the yeah. university. Um, and a follow-up about, question about your class specifically. Yeah. Um, Arlene is wondering if you are planning to use the quilt speaks exhibit at the North Carolina History Museum in Raleigh as part of your folklore class curriculum. I didn't know that they had one up, but I will go look. Thank you, Arlene. <laughs> I will find it. Yeah. Me, me neither. I'm I'm based out of yeah. Raleigh um, right now and I have I have not been to the museum in a while, but I love the quilt that's in object lessons. And um, I did have one question myself, while others, if you have um, questions for Professor Salwin, please feel free to put them in the Q&A box at this time. Um, at the beginning, when you were talking about, you know, storytelling, um, a great, you know, singer songwriter that I've grown up with is Taylor Swift, and her most recent album mm -hmm. is called Folklore, and it's the first of her albums that aren't as explicitly autobiographical or based on personal events mm -hmm. and so I was curious to hear your thoughts about uh, we talked about literary talked about oral storytelling but mm -hmm. then also musicians as folklorists absolutely um oh, where where to begin um uh, I mean, I know people in in folklore were uh, a, a very excited uh, at, at that although there was not much warning. So people were like, oh, Taylor Swift will make people interested in folklore. So we were madly getting uh, better, uh, uh, you know, sort of easy to reach. Uh, yeah, to get people to sort of, you know, connect from their interest in her music too. But musicians are, of course, a, a you know, a really important part of, of folk music. And they're fascinating I mean, both because there are, you know, regional styles um, all over the world, um, but also uh, because, I mean, thinking about what Elizabeth has been leading me to, th these ways in which traditional styles then become, um, you know, they, they have to morph and change. And so they're, on the one hand, for someone who's a, like a contemporary American musician, there are lots of elements of blues or old time or bluegrass that they can potentially draw upon. Um, but also that there are so many communities of participatory musicians who play those kinds, particularly old time is fascinating. Um, there's a whole scene up around Asheville that people may know about, which, which has like punks and old time musicians from, the, from the, the county who get together, like completely different political backgrounds, that kind of thing. Um, but also the way in which the, over the last 50 or 60 years, the interest in young people from other parts of the country, it was people who were, you know, my, my generation of professors who came and, um, and studied with, you know, found Doc Watson, studied with other traditional musicians in, in North Carolina, particularly. And, but now those folks are gone and their children, if they are musicians, are probably more interested in contemporary styles. And so the experts of old time music are now, you know, people who are graduate students or, you know, Joseph de Cosimo got a PhD in, in our department thinking about this kind of an issue that tradition may get, you know, the, the traditional style may get passed into a very different group of people while the tradition of family music making may go down in the family, but uh, be, be in a, but it's a very different kind of music. So 
I don't know if that answers some of what you were thinking about. Definitely. No, I, that okay. album has been on repeat in our household. Oh, and okay. um, she, she tells stories from multiple perspectives, which is one of the things you're referencing, just yeah. talking about folklore as a whole. And she also does one song that I think is cool. It's called The Last Great American Dynasty. That is about the woman who lived in the house Taylor Swift bought in Rhode Island and her life story. Mm -hmm. And so when you were talking about kind of coded language and subtleties there, I think you know, I think Taylor also kind of maybe made history cool with that song as yes. people might want to be like, oh, I want to go research the woman who lived in the house before Taylor did. She sounds, you know, really fascinating. She was a bold woman of the time, but how much of it is backed in historical fact and how much of it might be myths and legends that the town people <laughs> had about her. Right. So, yeah. And to Patricia's earlier point, what is Taylor Swift doing when she is positioning herself in parallel to this fascinating historic figure, right? The way that she's like positioning the narrative and that that parallelism. Yeah, it's lots to think about. Um, Patricia, thank you so much. This was such a lovely um, opportunity to chat with you. Um, and I, I, I get to do it again, but I'm sure oh, great. <laughs> Good. everyone else enjoyed it as well. Thank you so much. Great. All right. And thank you, Elizabeth and Lindsay. And um, those who've been listening to us. Yes, absolutely. Thank you both of us for providing this fascinating lunchtime discussion. And as Elizabeth mentioned at the beginning of the session, the Ackland is open um, on a limited capacity timed entry system. Um, should you wish to see some of the objects that we looked at today in person at object lessons and as well as the rest of the museum. So thank you very much uh, for joining us. And as Elizabeth said, our next Art for Lunch is gonna be coming up next month and you can register for that lunchtime program on our website. We hope to see you there.